right now. You're all set. All right. Chair notes the time is 6.06. .06. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA Chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with a roll call of ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Present. Mr. Everald Henry. Here. Mr. Philip White. Present. And Ms. Hilda Greenball. Here. The quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Mr. Um, Rob Wachilla, planner for the town, and C Ms. Christine Brestrup, planning director for the town. We also have Carolyn Murray, our um, counsel on this matter from KP Law, uh, also attending. And um, the applicants will introduce themselves, uh, who are presenting will introduce themselves later. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws, General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Chapter of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. And these may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and its ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board for during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or to gather additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing pound nine on their phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where the information about the project and input from the public is gathered followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is where the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition is heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Tonight's agenda, um, a public hearing on ZBA FY2024-03, Valley Community Development Corporation, request for a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B to construct 30 owner-occupied affordable residential units located in 15 duplex structures, parking areas with 58 spaces, common areas and other site improvements on a 9.047 acre site, which we requested, <laughs> requested waivers from the zoning bylaws general bylaws, subdivision regulations, and sewer water connection approvals at 2040 Ball Lane, Map 5A, Parcel 56, RN Residential uh, Neighborhood Residence, and RLD Low Density Residential Zoning Districts, and FC Farm Conservation Overlay Districts. This meeting is continued from our last meeting on this subject, November 30th, 2023. The topics tonight are stormwater management, and stormwater infrastructure design. Following that, there's a time for public, general public comment on any matter not before the board tonight and other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. So uh, before we start, Rob, has there been any additional submissions since our last meetings? So the only additional submission is an email from town engineer Jason Skeels, and I can quickly read the email, Mr. Chairman, if that's okay. Please do. All right. So basically, Jason Skeels emailed myself and Chris Brestrup at about 1.30 this afternoon. 
Um, he states that he didn't have the chance to do an in-depth, thorough review of the entire application, but upon his initial peripheral review, he does not see any glaring issues with the drainage or the site layout for this project, including the proposed utility connections. All the drainage calculations appear to be in order, and the stormwater management is an overall improvement over existing conditions. Um, and I believe there is also... Did you mention the comments submitted from uh, Aaron Jack, the well, weather administrator? I thought we had included that at the last meeting because it was in uh, eleven twenty. Oh yeah, that's correct. Email. My apologies. Yeah. yeah. So that would that we I think noted last meeting. Yep. Um, are there any disclosures by board members? Lastly, just to give everybody a heads up, our topics are coming up for the December 21st meeting is property management, income restrictions, financials, applicant selection process, and local preference. And right now we have a tentative meeting scheduled for January 4th that will deal with waivers, conditions, and findings. Um, we may have to go longer than that due to um, schedules of board members, but right now that's what the schedule for this application is set for. So uh, unless board members have any questions or any um, statements to make before we begin, I'd like to ask the applicants to um, identify themselves for the record. Let us know who's going to do the presentation. Uh, give us your name and your address again for the record, and we can proceed. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, board. My name is Jessica Allen. I am a project manager at Valley Community Development. Um, as tonight we are talking about stormwater and utilities, I'm going to pass the presentation to Josh Klein, who's with Stonefield Engineering, and he can walk the board through all of the details of the stormwater plan. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Yes, Josh Klein. I'm a partner with Stonefield Engineering and Design. Um, our address is 120 Washington Street in Salem, Mass. Um, then I, you know, kind of, as we get into it, you know, I am a licensed professional engineer in, in nine states in the Northeast, and I have presented in front of zoning boards, planning boards, conservation commissions um, across those nine states as well. Great. Thank you. You may proceed. All right. Well, perfect. I'm going to start with sharing the screen. So what we're presenting tonight is this is the illustrative plan um, that was submitted and kind of we've been talking to um, for the last kind of several meetings and going to kind of highlight a few items I think we wanted to talk about tonight. So I'm going to kind of talk about stormwater first. I think that's the, you know, really the important reason we're here and drives a lot of the civil engineering components. We're going to talk a little bit about snow storage and then a little bit about earthwork. And I'm obviously happy to answer questions at any point in time. Feel free, feel free to stop. Um, so if anyone wants to give me the hurry up sign, take it. I'm going to try to be quick. You know, I don't want to give a total lesson on stormwater, but you know, I wanted to kind of drive kind of the intent of the project, you know, so, you know, this is, you know, kind of in our mind, we call it a disturbed site. Um, you know, it's not a kind of natural site or a wooded site or an undisturbed site. It's disturbed, but there's obviously not a, a lot of impervious surfaces. So stormwater is a, a key component to this project. And really, you know, you know, Jess and other members of the team would, you know, state that we've spent a lot of time looking at it. You know, we've modeled this in our in civil 3D program. So, you know, we're able to kind of look at all different factors in terms of changing elevations, changing, changing drainage patterns. What would the impacts be? Um, we've done two rounds of test pits. So we did a preliminary round of test pits to check the soils on site. And then we did a second round once we were kind of able to dial in our stormwater facilities a little further. So we've, we've spent a lot of time and energy putting together design and we're, we're really excited to present it. I mean, this design is really, you know, kind of the peak in terms of mass DEP best management practices. Um, you know, we're capturing and fully infiltrating the site. So there are, you know, we look at both the city of Amherst as well as the Mass DEP um, standards. You know, we call it either BMPs, best management practices, but there's a stormwater handbook. There's three volumes that we kind of use as our guide when we're designing. There's 10 standards. Tonight, we're really going to talk about three of them because they're the, kind of the crux of what we look at when we're, when we're doing stormwater design. So the first big item we'll be touching on is water quality, groundwater recharge, and then quantity is kind of how we shorten it, but it's the idea of peak flow. So what I what I think is important to understand about the existing site is there are no stormwater you know features out there today. There's no kind of designated stormwater BMPs. There's no kind of real stormwater control. Um, and so really one of the big goals is with this redesign is instituting those best management practices and make sure that 
water is not going off to neighbors, water is not going off uncontrolled, water is being treated. Um, so the site really is what the elevation is really what's driving a lot of this. The site changes from about 25 feet from the bottom right corner to the top left corner, kind of working its way down towards the intersection. Uh, there's there's pretty much a natural kind of ridge um, that I'm highlighting on the bottom right hand. So you have kind of runoff from the site kind of coming down into the Mill River tributary. And then the rest of the site really drains kind of to both roads, the wetland ditch, but ultimately makes its way to an inlet kind of at the corner of Pulpit Road, which ultimately come, goes across Pulpit Road and then makes its way to a, another stream. Um, there's kind of a bridge that we found, we believe there's a, that's where the culvert kind of comes out in. So really what we kind of talk about is points of interest or POI. So those are really the two main areas that we analyzed if you kind of look into our report. So from there, what we, what we kind of look to do is implement stormwater management practices um, to meet these state standards. So what we've done on this site, because we have good soils, because we have groundwater separation, we're able to infiltrate. Infiltration is the best stormwater practice we can institute. You know, it's natural, it's putting water back into the ground, it's naturally filtering it, it's cleaning it, it's meeting TSS or suspended solids, it's removing kind of those fines from it. It also provides kind of natural phosphorus and nitrogen uh, removal as well, which is something, again, we're not required to meet, but it's, it's a great practice and something that we're doing through infiltration. Um, for example, some states, you know, require you to infiltrate if you can um, because of the benefits of infiltration. Rhode Island would be an example of that. They really, they see the benefits and the removal of bacteria through infiltration practices. Um, so what we do here is we break our stormwater system up into really two components. There's the pretreatment and then the system itself. So the goal really was to design the site to kind of naturally reduce flows to Mill River. And then the rem the remainder of the site, the majority of it goes to the stormwater infiltration system kind of in the top left corner of the site. Now there is, I'll zoom in, there's another small infiltration system that captures some of the road. And one of the challenges is kind of this driveway is a little bit too low that we're not able to move stormwater from the driveway to this system. So that's why you have this kind of smaller self-contained kind of system. And we also, kind of trying to preserve this natural area between the two systems um, and kind of, you know, kind of to put that connectivity would really cause a lot of disturbance uh, that we don't feel is necessary. Um, so what we do is in the majority of the, the site area where, where the homes will be, we have a conveyance system that captures the water. We have hoods and sumps so that the water kind of gets that natural pretreatment. Then eventually it's discharged into a four bay that allows the suspended solids to kind of drop and then it overflows into our stormwater infiltration basin. This project will be capturing and infiltrating the entirety of the 100 year storm. That's really important to note because we're, we only are required to capture and infiltrate the water quality storm event or the groundwater recharge storm event. And we're not only doing that, we're capturing the two year, the 10 year and the 100 year storm events um, that we as engineers kind of look at. And with all of that stormwater that's now being captured and put into the ground, you know, we also have the necessary safety measures in place to ensure that this, this stormwater infiltration system, you know, will have the longevity um, that, that is required for the project. Um, there is an emergency spillway that's provided. So kind of in case of that emergency moment, we want to make sure water can get safely out. And it was kind of strategically placed kind of outside of the 75 foot buffer, but is kind of kind of directed towards this existing inlet there today. So again, there's no houses or um, anything downstream of this stormwater management system. We kind of strategically place it on site in an area that allow, would allow it in an overflow condition to go um, to an inlet. Um, what we also do is kind of part of this kind of overall design, and we have a sheet in, in a SWIP that's been prepared, is soil erosion control is a key, to, key component that we look, look at. So we're incorporating kind of standard practices in terms of temporary measures, silt fence, you know, kind of construction entrances, dust control, kind of all the, the measures that are outlined in the handbook volume three. We also will be kind of instituting permanent measures. Um, you know, we have, you know, seeding, uh, landscaping areas, kind of we can, there are impervious areas that provide that natural permanent um, stabilization. And then kind of in terms of the long-term, um, you know, kind of in working with town staff, so we'll work with Jason and Aaron, we developed an initial operations and maintenance manual to kind of be able to maintain 
um, for the community to maintain these stormwater systems. Um, it's something that we, we're we going to kind of work with them to kind of fine tune, and it's typically kind of finalized as part of the construction process, uh, but that will allow this community to take care of these systems in the future. You know, they'll they'll have, an, you know, a booklet that outlines exactly what needs to be done on typically a quarter quarterly, you know, biannually or annually basis. Um, there are kind of different practices that are taken or inspections to kind of ensure, you know, all the components of the system are kind of functioning properly. So that's that's really the the high level. If I had to kind of sum it up into a couple sentences, you know, today there are no stormwater management practices on site. You know, we understand that we're introducing development, we're introducing impervious. So what our goal was is we've now captured all of that runoff that we're creating and we're holding it and we're putting it in the ground. And by putting it in the ground, we're naturally filtering it and we're reducing peak flows um, to ensure that there's no adverse impact to the public right-of-ways around our sites, as well as any kind of neighbors in all directions. So I'm happy to kind of take a pause if, if there are any kind of specifics or if, or if Chair, you'd prefer me go through the whole presentation at the end, I'm happy to do either. Do you have, um, I guess if we open up for some questions now, you have more that you want to present to us, Mr. Klein? So I would I would touch on snow storage and earthwork. Yeah, I'd like to do that. Okay, so why don't we why don't we do that? Those will be even a little quicker. I don't want to. Well, let's just uh, see if anybody has a quick question right now, Mr. Klein. And I don't I don't see anybody's hand up. All right, so go ahead and let's talk about this. That was something we brought up last meeting. So let's talk about the snow storage. That's great. So we we took some time. We sat down with the team and kind of refined the areas a little bit um, based on kind of the landscaping plan um, that's kind of in place. So what I've done in, in kind of a teal color, um, I've highlighted four areas on site, uh, which would be the kind of designated snow staging or snow storage areas. It's about 5,500 square feet that you're seeing, you know, just to give the board a sense, you know, in, in New Hampshire and Maine, some municipalities kind of look to provide a factor of about 10% for storage. So if you have a um, you know, a 10,000 square foot parking lot, you provide a thousand square feet of storage. So to, to give a reference point, we have about 25,000 square feet of like parking and driveways that would be kind of maintained, you know, in these main areas. Um, so that's about 2,500 square feet. So you're, what you see on the plan is about double that. So kind of 20% of those areas, um, you know, a lot of times when we go North, we'll do more refined, you know, calculations, but we did also do another gut check, kind of looking at, again, those total areas, kind of assuming a 12 inch, 12 inch event um, and kind of applying a typical compaction factor. There's more than enough room to kind of capture those storm events. So, you know, what, you know, what we, we typically see in these snow staging areas and these types of developments are, you know, through property management, you know, obviously there are big storms that come and we can't control those, but we don't really like to design for a 24 to 36 inch storm event. You know, at that point, you know, additional equipment and movements required. I mean, any, any site obviously, you know, requires a little bit of staging. So what we're looking at, you know, are those repeat events. Like you know, if we have a two to three inch storm event, two to three inch storm event, two to three inch storm event in a row, you know, is there enough room to, to hold the snow on site and kind of incorporating these, these four areas, there's plenty of room. You know, we don't have any kind of concern. Um, and what we find a lot of times with these types of parking lots is, you know, that property managers will use equipment like Bobcats um, or small, um, smaller vehicles that they're able to kind of kind of maneuver and pick up and use like a bucket to move snow. Um, so that is one of the advantages. There are some other open spaces. You know, if there were a, a large event, you know, an unforeseen large event, you know, there would be, there would be the ability for a bobcat or a bucketed vehicle to be able to move snow kind of into uh, like an unused area on site. But again, we're we're not that concerned, you know, given the amount of space. You know, one of the nice things is we have this nice area uh, along the driveway on Montague. So even if, you know, area is filled up over here, you know, the property management company could move snow from, this, from these areas and use this as a larger staging area. That was one of our plans kind of with this new layout. Um, so overall, we think this, you know, hopefully kind of addresses some of the questions and concerns from the last meeting. Are you still um, looking at using some of the, the uh, hatched parking spaces as temporary snow um, holding areas or are those, have you changed your mind on that? 
So the, the spaces aren't being used, but a snow storage area is shown behind them, right. which is really nice because, again, they're temporary. We also kind of extended it behind the ADA accessible spaces because they're typically the least used. So potentially if there's one open, they could kind of go and put snow behind there or use an access aisle if they have a smaller loader. And then we show another small area that can be accessed you know, from the dumpster area and from the striped area on the other side. So none of the spaces are shown. We're not going to be staging in any of the parking spaces. Um, so there's plenty of room kind of outside of there. Got it. I think that answered some of the questions that were, were raised at the last meeting. Perfect. <clears throat> Great. So what I can I can do and kind of touch on last, um, I know it was that it was kind of talked about earthwork. Um, and this was kind of an exhibit that was that was submitted, a soil movement exhibit or earthwork exhibit. Um, not that, you know, if you don't see these every day, they're a little tricky sometimes to read. So I'll zoom in to kind of help in an area. So we have pluses and minuses. Pluses are areas that we're filling or the, the proposed surface is higher than what the existing grade is. And then minuses are in kind of areas that we call cut or export where we're lower than the existing surface. Um, so green is, is fill, blue is cut. So what you're seeing here is a majority of a fill of a fill condition. Now it is common when you look at surface to surface to always have a little bit of fill because we have to remember that sidewalks, foundations, pavement sections all have stone underneath them. So a lot of times what we're trying in a perfect world, you know, we almost want to set our proposed surface about a foot above existing because we want to account for the stone section that goes under the pavement. Now we do have a case where you know we have a challenging site. I think I mentioned in the beginning we have 23 feet of grade change across the site, um, so we're not in an ideal situation. It unfortunately is not a flat site. It's not a rectangle. We're not in a perfect world. So, you know, we went through a bunch of different iterations, kind of with the team, and kind of talked about and weighed out our options. And um, this current option, you know, creates kind of fill conditions, kind of in the housing areas. Uh, one of the big reasons for that is we want the houses to have make ensure that runoff is draining away from them. So we don't want to kind of sink these houses down and have runoff kind of running into the kind of the areas. We want to be kind of shedding water away from the homes. Um, we also um, are kind of proposing a gravity sewer system. Um, and based on the grade change in order to kind of provide those minimum slopes for the gravity sewer design, some of the homes on the right hand side of the screen, we had to kind of lift a little bit. I mean, again, they're they're kind of within a natural tolerance of what's around them. There's no retaining walls, there's no steep slopes, but you know we had to elevate them a little bit just to ensure that we can get the sewer out gravity. Now, as we get into a construction document, it may make sense you know, to you know, slightly lower um, a couple of the homes and incorporate potentially a small pump um, for that individual home. Uh, but again, the tension here is we're kind of using a gravity fed system with it. So again, you can, see kind of some of the blue areas with the stormwater basin, you know, you're filling a little bit on one side, you're cutting a little bit on another side to kind of balance it. Um, and again, where the area where the homes is, is where you're seeing a little bit of that fill. And that's really to kind of account for some of the factors noted. So happy to go into more depth. I don't know if there's any questions on the, on the exhibit that was provided. I appreciate you doing that. I looked at this today and I didn't quite understand how to read it. And you've explained it to me. Um, I could, I kind of thought it blue and green meant plus and minus, but I wasn't quite sure. And this, but I do have one question, and that is, what's the depth of the containment basin that's up on the? I guess it'd be the north western side up here. What's the depth of that, and how long? So, and how much water is going to be in there, and how long will that water stay? We're not creating a lake, in other words. What? How long is it going to be? Is water going to be standing in that area? No, this is. The definitely an infiltration system so water yep. will not be bonding um, i'm just pulling up the exact draw time so it has to drain for the requirement within 72 hours uh, let me just grab the exact number i want to say we're closer to you know 24 to 30 mm -hmm. for the 100 year event which is pretty good i mean you know again we have 72 hours to do it um and the during the largest peak event i had that number written down um, the larger basin would hold about 22,000 cubic feet. Um, you know, for reference, it is a big number when we think about, you know, 
filling up our car. I mean, it'd be 165,000 gallons. Um, but again, the, um, uh, it's not a, it's a very shallow system. So I just wanted to kind of zoom in. Let me reshare it and I'll zoom in on it. So that was one of the nice design intents of the system is we've made it a very shallow system. So the bottom of the system, um, is about 92 and a half and the top is, uh, I believe about 94 and a half. So it's okay. Uh, a very shallow system so it'll kind of fill out fill up but then again it drains and in about let's see the complete infiltration times 25 hours and can i just jump in on one quick point too is that a part of the intent on keeping the grades um pretty slight is that we were really trying to incorporate this into the natural landscape we didn't want somebody to be driving by the site and to see this giant industrial looking um, stormwater infiltration basin. So the design team um, collaboratively spent a lot of time trying to design something that was biomorphic in shape, kind of really blended into the landscape. So that's another reason to have some of those um, more smoothed out grades rather than something very dramatic. The other reason is just safety. And you, what you've done is, is it seems to me that you created is something that is even for, for a, a two year event will drain very quickly. Um, Correct. For a hundred year event, it's hard to plan for that. But for a two year event, you're gonna, it's gonna be draining very quickly and, prop, and won't, if you tell me, it won't create a problem for uh, children walking into the into the, the um, infiltration basin, right? Am I correct? Correct. correct. That's my, that was my concern, okay. I had one other question regarding drainage. Uh, if you look at the future, the, the red outlined area, the future community <laughs> garden area. So under most circumstances, not after a, immediately after a rain event, is that going to be a dry area to walk through? Is it going to be wet and squishy when you walk through it, or do you envision that being um, like your yard? It's going to you can after a, a rain, it'll be wet for a while, but it'll be easy to walk through, and it won't be a a mushy area so that it could be used for a community garden, could be used for play area, could be used for other kinds of things. Is that correct? So the, that is correct. I mean, the red area is kind of that natural meadow. So it, it definitely dries out. It definitely, especially with the slope, it's not like an area that ponds. So it's, it's kind of what you would typically see in a meadow or a field. And then the, the rest of the site will kind of be all new, you know, that no mow, uh, material that was talked about, which is the same thing that that was one of the reasons with the design and ensuring there's proper flow is we don't have areas where water is going to pond and create those mucky conditions. You know, the site is designed that all runoff is going to either, you know, inlets that where it's being captured or kind of directly to the forebay of the infiltration basin to avoid creating those kind of mushy wet spots. Great. If I may just piggyback off Mr. Judge's question, very, yes. very brief, I saw that Miss Best. Um, Greenbaum has her hand up. So looking at the community garden and snow removal, um, is the snow, does it look, I'm just trying to understand, is snow removal like pushing towards the site for community garden? Isn't there a concern there to Steve's point that it may become like mushy, over flooded with water when the snow melts? You know, it's, it's such a, a small amount you know, we're not, you know, again, we're not talking like a shopping center where you have these huge piles that sit and take weeks and weeks and weeks to melt. You know, these are these are pretty small parking areas. And, you know, what's what is nice about the site, it has some natural grade onto it. So the even these snow areas as they melt, they'll push out. So it, it won't be any different than, you know, when you if you, you know, see a parking lot in an apartment complex or your home and you shovel your driveway and you have some piles that take a little bit longer to melt and they might be a little bit wet in the springtime, uh, but they're gonna dry kind of just, you know, as, as a normal site would. Uh, Ms. Greenbaum, you have your hand up. Uh, please, uh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yep. Um, a couple of questions. On the other picture you showed of the cut and the fill, I wanted to know what the units of measurement were on that. Was that feet or was that inches? And curious about the volume that's being moved around. Do we have to make a finding under the section of the bylaw that relates to earth moving around? 
I can't remember how many thousand square feet of what what are they what are these numbers here? Are they feet or inches? So these are feet. And and so how do you know the volume that's being moved? So on the side. It, it's to yeah. the yeah. It, if you could zoom in on that chart, Josh, I think that would be helpful. So what 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 we look at is you know, it again, things get a little complicated, but to simplify it, we have a surface to surface, which are kind of the existing in the proposed, you know, finished grades, we'll call it. And then we look at the removal of material because, you know, existing foundations and slabs and pavement has to get taken out. Um, and then we look at new material being brought in. So that was kind of that conversation about like underneath the pavement, we have to bring in gravel um, to put under the pavement. So it's new material that needs to be used. And then we kind of sum that up um, where you'll see kind of that that surface to surface, you know, get modified. So again, overall, um, it is a fill site. So it's about 6,600 cubic yards um, of fill so associated with the project. So is that more or less that's in our bylaw where we have to make a finding? So actually, I'm I'm looking into that right now, Hilda. So I'm looking for that section of the bylaw to to verify that. But if worst case scenario, if it's something that has to be addressed in the bylaw, that's another waiver that could be added. Yeah, that's um, that the board can grab. But well, I will but... look into that right now, and then I guess other folks can ask their questions, and I can report back I once have... I find an answer. Yeah, I have a second one about okay. this. Um, you got the snow piles close to to where the infiltration basin is. What about cars that come in there that are covered with salt and grime from roads other than the ones that are on site, which somewhere I saw, it said they can't use salt, but have to use whatever was specified, I can't remember. But, but so cars come in and bring debris from other areas that, does that have any, any chemicals that may be on the car from somewhere else have any impact on the infiltration basin? I guess I'm trying to ask. No, that's a great question. So, you know, kind of in locating some of our snow storage areas, you know, one of the keys is you can't just take all your snow and push it right into an infiltration basin. So um, that's why the largest kind of area is kind of shown by the driveway. Um, it's a pretty small area and part of it would be kind of within the pavement. Um, but this area does kind of drain down to the forebay. So the idea would be if there's any kind of sediment or things like that, um, you know, they would be kind of part of that natural kind of maintenance cycle associated with the basin. Um, and, you know, again, you know, having, you know, a few different snow storage areas on site allows these areas to stay a little bit smaller. So you're not kind of seeing these large kind of piles next to the stormwater facility. So you're, there's not much chance of amounts of salt getting into the system? Is that what you're saying? I think, <clears throat> I don't think it's a, a, a big concern, um, you know, not for right. us, kind of with the location. Again, you know, one of the, the reasons you're not seeing kind of the snow storage being located in directly kind of in the infiltration area, uh, kind of keeping it outside of that, of the infiltration system. So Hilda, I did um, find out the amount of fill that triggers a special permit requirement. And according to section 5.10, the bylaw, it says if they're raising the existing grade of any portion of the property, 5,000 square feet or more in area by an average of two feet or more, um, that's what requires a special permit. So Josh, would you say that you guys are above that threshold or below it? Yeah, I, I probably you said 5,000 square feet area yeah and then um, by average of two or more feet in terms of raising the elevation or of fill being put on the site we're probably yeah i would i would say we probably in in a few areas would trigger that now i think okay. if you took the whole site mm -hmm. in consideration we probably wouldn't but if you just looked at a couple five thousand square foot areas you yep. probably yep. trigger it but the whole site probably averages out below that but a waiver might be a conservative kind of approach to that. I agree. That's what so, I'm thinking. That's so what Jessica, I'm... it probably would it would be recommended if it's not already a waiver, we should include that waiver from section five point ten of the zoning bylaw for fill, uh, just so we can get that. I might already list. have it in there, but I will double check. Yeah, just in case, just so we don't. I forget might have about flagged it. it already. Yep, I'll make a note of it. I didn't look at all of the waivers again. 
And if I might ask, Mr. Klein, the um, the area, the small area of the infiltration basin, it's kind of the step down, I would call it, before it goes to the larger area, that's there in order to um, allow solids, contaminants, and other things to, to fall down there, right? And before it gets into the stormwater basin, is that sort of a filtering system? Or not? Correct, uh, yes. It's kind of like, it's, you know, pre-treatment is probably the buzzword we use, but the idea is it, you know, kind of allows the water to slow down and settle. So you get those sediments to kind of drop out before it flows into the infiltration system. And you have that both at the large infiltration basin and also in the smaller one right by the um, the entrance. Correct. Yes, it's a little little bit smaller, but there's a yeah. four bay kind of right here, and then the infiltration system is the triangle. And then, this one's so really shallow. This is about a maybe a foot and a half. I think a foot of water. It drains in like 13 hours. I think in the hundred so, years. But getting there. back to um, what I was talking about mm -hmm. with the salt or whatever might come off the parking lot does does that get cleaned out when you do your quarterly cleanouts or whatever what in other words what's involved with the maintenance system for this you might as well explain that while you're on it yeah so there's you know there are our recommendations and practices we have to follow from the mass dep um but kind of highlighting them you know the big item is you know Typically, inspections is the first, you know, kind of measure we incorporate. So you either have a contractor or a licensed property manager. There's kind of different qualifications from the state. You know, they would go out and review the structures, review the systems, and kind of determine the condition. Um, and then what we what we set in this O and M manual is parameters that then require cleaning of the system. So you know, it might require manual. A lot of times, it's it can be done manually, uh, you know, through kind of shoveling, raking, things of that nature to kind of pick up the sediment, the debris. Um, and then in some cases you can bring, you know, vacuum trucks um, out to kind of vacuum sediment. Um, but there's a, a host of different, you know, items that are incorporated. Um, you know, what we, we wouldn't recommend, um, but it's kind of more, I think what they, a lot of times they do, like we wouldn't recommend Full on, I think you hear the term street sweeping and you he see the vehicles. It's not something we would recommend for this, but what we put a lot of times in the O&Ms is like hand sweeping or kind of hand cleanup. Like the property manager will be responsible, you know, kind of in the spring to sweep and pick up debris um, and to kind of ensure that it's maybe like we can call it like a hand street sweeping, which is another nice practice to kind of avoid, you know, what you what you kind of see sometimes is that salt and things kind of build up and that they can kind of come in and hand sweep it and kind of remove it from the site. My The history in this town, this is why I'm bringing this up, is particularly places like Log Town Road, I think the, the huge area there that's supposed to absorb the water, it was never maintained. It just went back to forest. So who makes sure, anybody in town makes sure that this inspection, et cetera, happens? I believe we have to submit an inspection report as part of the O&M plan, and that gets submitted to the town once the when the um, structures are cleaned and inspected. Correct, Josh? Correct. Yes, there's a there's a annual kind of submission that's made that kind of captures all the different um, inspections that are made throughout the year. And uh, would that be done by the property? Would that be part of the property manager's contract? Yes. Yes, it would. And um, and Rob, would that be something that we need to condition that, the, that that's a provision of the property manager's contract or is that best practices? Um, for so them? that sounds like something that the CONCOM would probably put in their conditions for their NOI. Um, but we can always, I could discuss that with Rob Moore and see what he thinks. Right. Um, usually on the stormwater side of things, uh, and I believe you guys have a, did you guys already have a public hearing date for that, Jessica, for your uh, notice of intent? Yes, we did. And it got continued until January 10th, I believe, okay. as of yesterday's meeting. <laughs> so um, I guess whatever conditions they propose to you guys, um, the zoning board would usually want to review those conditions and um, incorporate some of them into their own conditions. So usually if stuff is covered in the notice of intent, um, or sorry, the order of conditions, um, the zoning board wouldn't include that in their own set of conditions. 
but would reference that the applicant has to abide by those order of conditions from the Conservation Commission as well as these conditions of the comprehensive permit. So I guess to answer your question, Steve, we should probably wait to see what Conservation Commission does and then just go from there. I just wanted to make sure there was a way to avoid what um, Ms. Greenbaum had talked about, mm -hmm. which is that it, people would forget to do it. And so that would, I just want to make sure that that's part of the, so I'll the also note, company and the homeownership, the homeowners association. Sure. I'll, have to do it. Yeah. I'll also note that the master deed will reference the comp, the book and page of the comprehensive permit, and it will be tied to the master deed, which runs with every single yep. uh, unit in this property. So, um, so I think it would be prudent um Rob, that maybe the 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 comp permit does at least reference the concom order of conditions. That way, somebody can like track it through the um the uh deeds if needed. And I think, um, Mr. Chair, one thing we should also consider too. So, we could also condition, and this could probably be discussed in the next meeting, but uh, we could condition that um that the uh prospective buyers get a copy of both sets of conditions so they're aware, or at least the homeowner association gets both set of conditions so they're aware of what's currently allowed on the property when they're making any sort of future decisions. Um, just something to keep in mind. But again, that's for a different night. I don't want to go too much into that tonight. Sure. And Valley will be part of the board of managers on the condo association until we, until we sell a certain percentage of the units. And so we will be responsible for some of that property management work and can advise the new homeowners as such as we transition the property over to the homeowners. Good. Okay. It's something that can be, that will be handled. It sounds yes. Funny. Yes. Okay. It will be handled. Yep. And if it, the, I mean, for, for what I think it's worth, if it helps the, the stormwater practices and systems that we look to incorporate are very simple and very, you know, kind of commonplace in the state, which is nice. You know, you don't have complicated, you know, proprietary treatment devices or, you know, gravel wetland areas that are really difficult to maintain. We tried to keep it, and this was a big concern kind of working with Valley and Jess, right, is we wanted to make sure that that annual maintenance is, you know, kind of cost effective. So we're very lucky to be able to infiltrate because these are very, I mean, they're easy to maintain systems. They're very simple. And there's something that most any property manager, you know, can handle. It's not something tricky, um, which is really nice. I want to let other people, I had another question, but I want to let other board members ask before I ask my next question. I don't want to dominate the conversation. Uh, Mr. Then Mr. Klein, uh, can you, there's, there's one sheet that shows all the different physical structures that you're going to use to, to have water. Go, yeah, that's it. So almost when I was looking at this, it seems most of these are just pipes, right? Is that correct? Most of these are pipes, which goes to your point of being simple, um, and they it directs it down to lower areas or or right to the um, to, to I guess to the pre fill area, the, whatever the, whatever that the staging let's call it a staging area. The, the four bay it. is the four bay. Okay, the four bay. <laughs> it directs it to that. Do you have any pumps or anything more complicated? And where are those located? If you do. No, it's a very, a very simple gravity system. The reason I ask is that we have a pump. I've had some experience with, with pumps and it can be a mess when they get um, screwed up, they get filled and it's just, it can be a mess. And, so and I'll note that that's part of why um, we were okay with the idea of adding some additional soil. It is, it adds expense to the project, but our preference is to have, at least for the sanitary, a, a gravity system rather than a pump system, because in Valley's experience in the past, those pumps can be, as you noted, difficult to maintain, things get clogged, they become a, a, an operational maintenance nightmare. So it, it really was in our best interest to connect to the existing system that's on Ball Lane, um, mm -hmm. rather than do some convoluted pumping system that could cause problems for the homeowners down the road. And it's really important to keep this as as um, efficient, as least expensive as possible for these for the homeowners. For the homeowners, correct. Yep. Other questions from members of the board regarding the stormwater 
plans? Yes. Yeah, Ms. Greenbaum. Um, I can't read this plan. It's the one with the pipes and everything. It's too complicated to see, and I tried looking on the big one. I couldn't figure it out. What happens with the water coming off the roofs of the houses? So the the roofs are going to be. So let's see if we had a good example yet shown. Um, so we're what's we're looking FF? at what's up equals FF is finished floor. So finished floor is kind of the the floor, the first floor of the home. So the roofs, uh, there are going to be kind of gutters on roofs, so they'll come down and downspouts. So we're looking at two options kind of with the architectural team. So either the um, roof leaders will connect directly into the pipes or they could discharge to grade because we the way we've graded the site, which would allow it to then drain to the inlets on site. So kind of two, two options. On this map, the, the drains from the house. Yeah, we typically don't show downspouts, um, but again, there. So in other be... words, there's no foundation or, or curtain drain, anything like that. There probably there probably will be foundation drains ultimately. I mean, slab on grade construction, uh, but that's usually specified in the structural engineering drawings, like that are done for the for building permits. Okay, so curtain drains aren't part of this. Correct. Yeah, what we're looking at is the capturing and the treatment of the stormwater runoff um, versus kind of the management of the foundation systems of the building. I guess so. Take your word for it. All right. Mr. Klein, do you have other things you wish to present to us tonight? Um, I'll kind of, you know, at this point, hopefully it wraps everything up. I know, Jess, I don't know if you wanted to touch on kind of the area in red tonight or not, or if we're going to talk sure. about any of the other things. Um, we can just let the board know that the design team met earlier this week to review all of the comments from the last meeting. And um, one of the things that we've come to is that we are going to designate generally that area that's identified in red as a future co community facilities area. So those community facilities could be a community garden, it could be a community house, it could be a pavilion, it could be a fire pit, it could be a tot lot, it could be a playground, it could be whatever the community members want it to be, but we'll label it as community facilities, that way it kind of captures everything. Um, and so that is where we're going to be designating um, for those facilities. And you'll see that on a future site plan once we get all final revisions. We're kind of going back and forth with CONCOM. So um, you know, we'll do one final big set of revisions and submit that to the board once we're wrapped up with CONCOM. Uh, one of the things that I did want to ask is I noted in Aaron's uh, November 20th memo, she had some concerns about the O&M plan. She had some concerns about things that weren't answered yet. And I think it was Part of it was it was preliminary, it hadn't all been settled, but part of it was also, I think, a continuing negotiation between the CONCOM and you, or at least a discussion between the CONCOM and you. Yep. So um, those things are going to be dealt with on the 10th, is, is that correct? Yeah, so we had a preliminary meeting with um, Aaron and Jason um, to discuss all of those comments that Aaron provided. We met with her on Monday morning. Um, we walked through everything. I think that we've addressed everything to her satisfaction. It just needs to be formalized. Um, and so we'll, Josh is going to be putting together a formal memo response and addressing all of those concerns. But I think we've pretty much hashed everything out. Josh, do you, am I misinterpreting anything or do you agree? Nope. Yeah, that's that's correct. So just for the benefit of the of the other board members, for the most part, a lot of this, this stormwater and the runoff um, is, much of it is governed by state law, which we can't waive. Some of it is, is governed by municipal, by Amherst bylaw, which we could waive if that's what we wanted to do. But we tend to, the board has tended to, in the past, always defer to the CONCOM and other uh, departments when they have recommendations for the, uh, a, a specific project like this. Um, so we'll see it. Um, we'll see the ComCom um, 
recommendations. We'll see that what they agree to, what they've um, what they've negotiated with the applicant. Um, but I anticipate that we will find what they do um, makes sense, and we we'll probably just adopt that or reference that. But you know, we have the ability if we don't like it, if we are troubled by it to override and to waive part of, or to disagree with part of their uh, recommendations that deal with only the municipal bylaws or the, the town bylaws, not the state law provisions. So yeah, I'll just, yep, I'll note that we're meeting the local wetlands bylaws. So we reviewed that with Aaron and there's no waivers that would need to be requested because we're actually meeting it. So it's okay. designed It's designed and is meeting the local, good. local bylaw, yep. All right. Great. I have no further questions. How about other board members, staff? Mr. Klein or Ms. Allen, do you wish to say anything more? I guess I would just, uh, not directly on the stormwater um, issue, but I would remind you that, you know, we had a couple of questions from uh, last, but we're, I'm, I'm sure you're still looking at whether it was the light fixtures or other things that had been brought up. We can talk about, we can deal with that either if you're ready to talk about it now or we can talk about it later when you've had a chance. You haven't um, had a lot of time since our last meeting. Sure, we actually did submit um, additional supplemental information to uh, Mr. Rochilla this morning. So, um, we did submit, uh, I submitted a response memo to all of the planning board comments questions. So that has been provided. Um, I, we also submitted uh, lighting fixtures. So there's three different options that we've provided um, for discussion of the board. Um, we also submitted a revised shed design. Oh, okay. um, and we have submitted updated building footprints, which include an expanded um, outdoor storage area. So those were the elements that were submitted at like yeah. noon this morning, today. So it was a little last minute, wasn't able to get into your meeting packet. So we can either discuss them and it'll be sort of fresh and new for you, or we can wait till the next meeting and you can have it in your packet and take the time to, to look at it. So it's it's to the discretion of the board, whatever you'd, you'd prefer. I would prefer us to be able to look at it before we discuss it. And I think it'd be much more valuable that way. I haven't had a chance to look at that. Okay, sure. No problem. Um, did you Brown, send it out? Did we, did, did you send it out? No, no, so not yet. Uh, so I will forward it to everybody after this meeting. And Steve, would you rather discuss those things at the next hearing? Or would you rather save that for the last? Well, I, you know, I, I think it's optimistic to call January 4th the last since ComCom is meeting on the 10th. So um, I think we should schedule dealing with that on the 4th. Mm -hmm. It looks to me like we'll have a pretty full agenda on yeah. uh, on the 20, on the 21st, is it? Is the next meeting? The 21st. Yep, yep that's, that's correct. I think that's going to be a very full agenda, and I, I don't envision that we're going to have a lot of extra time. So let's deal with those things by getting them out to the board so we can look at it and then putting that on the agenda for January 4th. I know so, – um the only member who won't be present at the January 4th is Mr. Meadows, who I think was about to, to speak to that. Okay. So, All right. so I'll know if uh, Mr. Meadows, have you missed any of these meetings yet or have you been present for all of them? Well, it depends upon how you look at it. Last week I had COVID and I was, I was there, but, <laughs> <laughs> but well, as I long can't as say that I can remember anything. You, you were present. You were present. present. Yes, yeah. I was present. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess... Um, we can always figure this out at the at the next meeting, but um, I guess so. Steve, you'd rather just not have me include these in the, in that meeting packet, but send them to all the board members so people send can look at them. Board members. In that yeah. way, Mr. Meadows can, if he has concerns, he can relate them to you, Rob, mm -hmm. uh, and it can be expressed at the meeting. Yeah, and then okay. we'll, and and there might be other things we have to kind of uh, clean up on the January fourth. Mm -hmm. Okay. When do you anticipate discussing the waivers? Because one of the items that I know that the board requested was a A&R plan of a flag lot. So that, that could be part of the waiver request. And I still need to coordinate that work with a surveyor. I'm working with Stonefield on that, but we have yet to nail that down. So I'd like to at least have some idea of when that's going to be needed so that I can push our surveyors. Um, right now, we 
are planning to, right now. We tentatively have the waivers scheduled for January fourth, but okay. I think that um, that list of waivers is a lot of it's you know it has to be done no matter what, but it's long, and I want to yes. you know it, it's very long. There's a lot of them, um, and it's typically what we do when we're in our final meeting before we go through all the the uh, conditions and make our findings and everything else. So. Um, what I would plan is let's try to start on the, let's clean up anything that we've had from earlier, from our current meetings, issues that come up where you, you're going to get back to us or we have further questions. Let's do that on the 4th. We can start the waiver process on the 4th, looking through the waivers. Um, I anticipate that we'll have a meeting sometime in early February. That would be the final meeting, on, or hopefully the final meeting on this because of schedules for Mr. Meadows and myself, we will not be able to have, um, not attend during, after January 4th. So that's, that's how I would like to proceed. I'd like to make the January 4th meeting valuable and worthwhile, do as much as possible in that time, okay. and then look yep. to the final time sometime in early February. Okay, so January 4th will be kind of a cleanup, finalize any last bits meeting, start looking at the waivers, and then, February will be reviewing the decision, finalizing the waiver list and kind that's, of, like, yep. Okay. Okay. That, that's the plan is we're kind of the back of the envelope plan. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. That sounds good. And then do we need to request an extension? Like uh, uh, the question um, is yeah. in terms of the length of this permitting process. Mm -hmm. So what was the drop dead date that this permit needed to be wrapped up by? We can talk offline. Just I want to submit yeah. a letter, and I just want to make sure I've got the right information. That's all. So I can look at that for you too, but I'm pretty sure, Carolyn, if I'm not mistaken, it was like mid January. I actually think you know it's 180 days from yeah. when the public hearing was open, mm -hmm. and I thought we actually had a little bit longer until April. Um, I know oh. I, I know I calculated that out at some point because we opened this. October 29th, something yeah. like that. October yeah. 29th. Actually, it was, so, it, was it October? That's what October I submitted it in September, so that would make sense. October um, 19th was the initial hearing. And so, 180 days. I actually have a calculator as like a go to. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I came up, I have written down here April 15th is our 180 days, but you can check me with your calculator. Go for it. Well, that's a date we won't forget then. Nope. Yes. <laughs> Friday, April 26th. Wow. Okay. So I guess no extension needed. <laughs> okay. No, great. <laughs> All right. Good. Ms. Brestrup, do you have your hand up? Is there anything else you want to add? Yeah, I was just going to suggest that um, Carolyn, Ms. Murray, and um, Mr. Wachilla and I start to work on uh, conditions and findings and, you know, try to get those together so we can, and also you know, waivers, make sure that those are all in order so that we will be ready when you're ready to review them because it takes a while to get all those things oh, yeah. correctly worded and we'd want to involve Rob Mora in that as well. Right. I think that makes sense. And we want to have them before the board so for a, a good amount of time so the board can look at them. Mm -hmm. yep. Great. Well, I have nothing else um, regarding stormwater and nothing else regarding schedule. Anybody else have questions? If not, um, I would entertain a motion that we continue this hearing until December 21st at 6 p.m. Is that correct? That's the right date, isn't it, Rob? Okay. Do I have a motion? So moved. So moved. Right, it's moved and seconded. I heard two, so I think the second one, Mr. Meadows, is a second. Um, is there any discussion on that motion? If not, uh, we'll vote. Chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Votes five nothing. It passes. We'll reconvene again on this matter on December 21st. Did we miss Mr. Mr. Allen, thank you very much for your work as always. Um, Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chair, we actually um, forgot to do public comment for yeah, this. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, I really yeah. do appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You um, can still, even though you voted to continue, you can still do your public comments if you wanted to.
Yeah. We, we will. We will do both. <laughs> but, um, but I really appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. That's a good catch, both Mr. Henry and Rob. Thank you. Yep. Um, if anybody is interested in public comment, please so indicate by raising your hand or by um, if you're on a phone, it's pound nine. I have no it's hands. It's actually star nine, if you don't mind my contradicting you. Oh, That's I like it. that because I've been saying it in my <laughs> introduction wrong for four or five months now. Star nine. Okay. Lots of, lots of good catches here in the last five minutes. Not see any hands up, Mr. Chair. No, I don't either. But we want to make sure we had the opportunity. I'm pretty sure a lot of these guys are also from uh, uh, Jessica's team, design team. So I don't think they have any questions for us. No. All right. Yep, most of them are. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we also, the next public comment period is general public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. And if anybody wants to talk on anything except this application, this is the time to do so with star nine for your phone or the or the uh, raised hand function on your screen. I see no raised hands. I see no public comments. Mm -mm. All right. Uh, next order of business is old business. Questions about the um, schedule or anything else? This is the time to ask that. I think we're all set. We won't prolong this meeting any longer than we have to. We all I do prolong. actually have one announcement. All right. Uh, so it's a quick one, I promise. Uh, so I am, I finished making the meeting schedule for next year for 2024 for the board. So I did send it to everybody. So when you get the chance, please take a look at it. Um, the only thing to note is that the fourth Thursday in November is Thanksgiving. So this past year, we, we did just one November meeting. I'm doing that, kind of proposing that again for, for next year's schedule. Um, and then December, the meeting is very close to Christmas time. So, you know, board members, when you get a chance, take a look. Let me know if there's any suggestions people have. If you're fine with it as it is, um, we can vote on it at the next meeting on the 14th of December. And I think Hilda has their hand and up. And I, I, I'm not a big fan of a December 26th uh, ZBA meeting. Okay. I don't know. If maybe other people are more committed than I am. No. But um, I would take that off, Rob. <laughs> Okay. You're very diligent, but I'm not as diligent as you. So would you want just one December meeting as well, or do you think we should do a different date? You know what I would meeting? do is I would put um, a date before the, the week before, put a tentative in case there's something we have to do at the end of the year, but hopefully we'll just have one meeting in December. Okay. I can do that. I do have a question. When yes. you when you check that calendar, mm -hmm. something I did not do is did you check it for Jewish holidays? Because tonight happens to be a Jewish holiday. Yeah, Hanukkah. And it took um, us a long time to convince the select board that we do not like to meet on Jewish holidays. I can double check on that, Hilda. I just have to um, look at the list and see what the dates are. Because I know a lot of them. The, the major ones that we like to are in the fall, right? Rosh Hashanah and Yom yeah. Kippur and Passover. Other than, other than that, families don't usually get involved. Okay, some can... do, some don't. But so you yep. said you, you said Yom Kippur, Passover, and Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. And, All right. That's all Rosh Hashanah can... and Yom Kippur, yes. And Hanukkah as well, I'm assuming, right? Well, that's tonight. Okay. But it will. But, but I don't we note it for next year. What did yeah. you say? We should note uh, Rosh. Uh, we should note it for tonight uh, for next year. Yom Kippur, Shana, Hanukkah, and... Well, it's not an issue uh, for me, but it is for a lot of people. Yeah. That's why we kept up our battle to add them to the list. It can be noted on the schedule, Rob. That's the best way. And yeah, we can that, that way we know ahead of time we won't accidentally schedule something. We, we can avoid, we can not have a meeting on a, on a holiday if it's, you know, if it falls yeah. on a holiday. We just We've been everything. added to BIPOC by a lot of people in Sudanwood. After October the seventh. All right. Any other points, questions? So, Rob, what you should do is why don't you um, recirculate those dates? Yep. And we can look at them um, on. I won't be here on the fourteenth. 
but I will be here for the 21st and we can discuss it then. Okay. So you want to push us off to the 21st? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. We can do that. Sounds good. But I'm, I'm going to count you to check the calendar. I'm, I'm right. Yeah. I will look at those holidays and see what dates yeah. they are this year. I got you, Hilda. We did just get a uh, calendar from either HR or someone in the administration that lists all of the holidays and the religious holidays. So we'll check mm -hmm. that. Yep. Are there any other holidays that people or other dates that people want to uh, avoid having a meeting on? And if so, just submit them to Rob. Um, yep. if, if you think of one. And the other thing I would say is look out and uh, on your schedule for the year. I mean, I know I have uh, um, some travel in July that I won't be, uh, that I'm going to tell Rob about and I won't be able to attend meetings at that point. But if you know ahead of time that you're going to be gone, it's helpful to have that so we can plan for alternates or other kind of um, yep. uh, provisions in case you're going to be gone. Or if there's one specific date that almost five people can't ever make, we're yeah. just not going to have a meeting that day. So okay. that's good to know as well. So any extended trips, that'll be nice to know. I know people don't usually plan vacations that far out. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So, you know, anything you can provide be helpful. Great. All right. We got it all. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, Carolyn, thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, um, folks. Good night. Do we have a no, we, we got to adjourn? Motion. We got to have a motion to adjourn. <laughs> so Jumbo. I entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Mr. Meadows moves. Is there a second? Second. All right, we've got it. It's moved and seconded. This is not debatable. We go to a, a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Vote is 5-0. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.